Hi, welcome everyone. We'll get started in just a moment. Hello, welcome everyone. My name is Sarah Carr and I'm Chief Knowledge Broker for Octo, Open Communications for the Ocean. And we're so pleased today to have Lucia Prieto here to talk about innovative tools for measuring and managing ecotourism impacts in marine protected areas. Um, before we get started and I turn things over to Lucia, I wanted to let all of you know a couple things. Uh, Lucia will be presenting first and then we'll have dedicated time for question and answer afterwards. Um, but feel free to send in your questions for Lucia at any point during the webinar. Um, there's two ways that you can interact on the webinar. We have a question panel, and we encourage you to send questions for Lucia into the question panel. Um, that's a little bit easier to moderate and see those. Um, however, we also have an, a chat, which in which and with the chat, you can actually interact with all the attendees on the webinar, as well as just um, Lucia and myself. Um, and if you want to send messages out or questions for the um, all the participants as a whole, or any resources that you know of that are relevant, or comments that are relevant, experiences that are relevant, um, feel free to post those in the chat and send to all the participants. We're happy to have them there. Just please keep that on topic. Um, and so but feel free to send in questions at any point during the webinar. Just And Lucia, I think that's all I had, so I'll turn it over to you now. Thank you so much, Sarah. I hope you can hear me well and you can see my screen. I hope that everything's working fine. Um, so thank you so much for the introduction and for the invitation uh, to be here today. It's a pleasure to be uh, talking to you today and sharing a very interesting topic that I'm very passionate about because we have been working on it for the past uh, 10 years already. So very happy to be sharing my experience with you today. Um, so as uh, Sarah was explaining, today I will be sharing with you some uh, tools that we have developed for measuring and managing ecotourism impacts in uh, protected areas in general, but that can also be applied to marine protected areas. So. Uh, for a bit of context, uh, I work at the IUCN, the International Union for Conservation of Nature. Uh, specifically, I come from the Mediterranean Center. We have our offices here in Malaga in the south of Spain. And uh, for if some of you don't know uh, the IUCN, just to give you a couple of notes about it, uh, it is a pretty unique organization. Uh, it is the only institution, I guess, that brings together governments uh, with civil society to work towards sustainable development and the conservation of nature. And uh, it is pretty unique because it is composed, I guess, of three different pillars. So we have uh, our membership-based um, we're a membership-based organization, so we have over 1,400 member organizations, and those include very different stakeholders such as uh, states, uh, government agencies at both national and subnational level. We have NGOs, large ones and small ones. We have uh, indigenous people's organizations, uh, scientific organizations, academia, etc. So it is a pretty uh, large mass of, of stakeholders. Um, and then uh, to be able to provide the know-how and the scientific knowledge uh, to those members, we have a pretty broad and active uh, network of scientists and experts in different topics. So we have over 16,000 scientists and experts that are uh, working in several different topics. And for that, we have uh, different uh, commissions. So uh, we have several commissions on education, on ecosystem management, on species, on different topics. Uh, and one of the maybe most relevant ones for the topic that we are going to be discussing today is the World Commission on Protected Areas that maybe you already know. 
And uh, within that commission, we also have a specific dedicated group uh, to tourism. It's called TAPAS. Maybe you know about it. It's a tourism and protected area specialist group. Um, in case you are also interested in joining those commissions and providing your expertise to, to these commissions, uh, they are free to join. You need to send your application, and then uh, the application will be reviewed, and maybe you can uh, start to be part of the of the IUCN of, of our union as well. So uh, that's the second pillar. And then we have another pillar, which is the IUCN secretariat, which is the one uh, trying to implement the vision of the union, both the, the members and, and the scientific community. Uh, we are around uh, 1,000 staff in over 50 countries, and I belong to to those people that are working for the for the secretariat. So that was for you to have a little bit of context of the work that we do at IUCN, uh, and then for you to to know a little bit what our priorities are uh, for 2030. Well, we have this IUCN Nature 2030 program that that, that is uh, guiding our priorities and shaping the the things that we do. So we have five key priorities that are land, water oceans and climate. And you will see here that at the very center of everything is uh, people. So uh, everything that we try to do uh, is involving the local communities, is involving the people that are living in the nature that we are trying to preserve. So that's for a little bit of context about IUCN and then uh, focusing on what we do here in the Mediterranean. As you know, uh, the Mediterranean is quite a big a uh, hotspot, both in terms of biodiversity and climate change. So uh, we are doing quite a lot of hard work in, in that sense. Uh, you will see here on the left side of the screen, our main areas of influence, or we are uh, trying to influence policy and convene different stakeholders. We are trying to generate knowledge and, and solutions to the different issues and challenges that we are facing. And uh, maybe you have heard about these different knowledge products that are uh, I am presenting here, for example, the red list of species, the green list of protected areas, etc. We are also providing capacity building to, to enhance uh, conservation action. And we are trying to promote, among other things, uh, nature solutions to uh, address the different challenges that we are facing. So those are the things that we are doing and we have different uh, focus areas. So one of them is agriculture and fisheries. We have uh, a big focus on species as well. Uh, we have a focus on plastics. And you will see here that one of the things that we are trying to do is to promote sustainable tourism in protected areas and trying to measure the impact of tourism. Mainly in coastal areas, since we are speaking about the Mediterranean, but also in other protected areas. So this is the focus that we are trying to bring to this webinar. So getting uh, already into the topic, so you know that uh, tourism in the Mediterranean is a big thing. It's a big thing uh, around the world, but uh, is one of the the Mediterranean is one of the leading tourism destinations. So you all know that. Tourism can be a big threat uh, to the ecosystems and uh, to the current model that we have. Um, for example, uh, you know that uh, the coast is highly uh, urbanized. The built-up area is gigantic. We are facing a lot of uh, pressure on natural resources, for example, on, on water. Uh, uh, waste management is very difficult to handle in peak season, etc. cetera. Um, Residents are also getting tired of the current dynamic that the tourism industry is going towards. You will have seen uh, people are uh, trying to to avoid the the current type of uh, direction the tourism industry in is going. Um, and you know that tourism is posing a lot of threats, but you know also that tourism, uh, when it is sustainable, when we are speaking about ecotourism can offer a lot of opportunities, mainly in terms of revenue. So with all of this in mind, we as uh, at, IUC, at the IUCN, we were trying to, to offer a kind of uh, solution to this challenge that we are facing in the tourism industry and trying to find a way to measure the environmental, but also the social impact that tourism is posing on ecosystems and mainly in protective areas. 
so that we could uh, see how to better manage those uh, impacts and try to preserve uh, the natural uh, eco ecosystems. So this is where the MEAT network was established. So uh, the MEAT network, MEAT stands for Mediterranean Experience of Ecotourism, and it is a uh, a network that was funded by IUCN, uh, Shul Biosphere Reserve, which is a protected area that is located in Lebanon, and also MedPan, the Mediterranean um, Marine Protected Areas Network. So those were the original organizations that founded the MIT network, but then we had uh, additional people joining us. And now we are working, for example, with the Travel Foundation that you may know, and also with the Global Footprint Network, which is the organization that helped to build the, the methodology that is behind our ecological footprint calculator that I will be speaking uh, about later on. And uh, we uh, kind of established this network, uh, trying to gather different Mediterranean protected areas, but also conservation organizations, tourism organizations that had a lot of knowledge about the issues that were currently, uh, that the Mediterranean was currently facing and try for them to work together and try to build a tourism offer that was uh, preserving the natural and cultural uh, heritage of the area, which is very, very rich. So we were doing that, that with a with a model that I will be um, explaining more about later on, uh, and trying to develop high quality products that were uh, offering an innovative and a, and a high quality offer, but that were also measuring the impacts, the ecological, social, and economical impacts of the activities that we were developing. So this is a little bit uh, the timeline that led to the creation and the establishment of the MID network. So as I was saying, it's been more than 10 years since we started working on this issue. Uh, we started um, developing uh, several EU funded projects. So that was the starting point. So we had uh, one first project that was called MEET, which you can find here uh, on the left side of, of the screen. Uh, then we had another different project, which was called Destimed, and then we had another project with, which, which was called Destimed Plus. So we started uh, developing ecotourism products. Then we started developing these standards and indicators that were uh, backing uh, the the, the system that was behind the development of the products. Then we focus a little bit more on uh, how to advocate uh, for a better ecotourism, for better ecotourism policies and how to promote uh, these uh, ecotourism itineraries in the tourism market. And all of this, you know that uh, when we are working with projects, sometimes we work very hard on it for four or five years and then the project ends and everything gets lost. So we didn't want that to happen. So all the knowledge, all the tools that we had developed, we tried to gather all that and we tried to keep all that. And that is why we created the Mid Network to uh, offer a place where all this knowledge that had been created uh, could be uh, located. So we, we didn't want to lose all the hard work that we had done on that uh, realm. So this is a little bit of the of the background of the Meet Network Association. So, uh, the idea of uh, the type of tourism offer that we develop is having protected areas, having parks in the center of the experience. So, uh, we conceive this uh, as. Uh, the main thing that we are doing, we need to have the protected area values, we need to have the protected area involved from the beginning of thinking about the, the, the ecotourism product and the ecotourism offer. So uh, you will see here that we have worked in almost, uh, not almost more than 40 protected areas. So uh, these 10 years, this is all the work that we have been doing through several uh, projects and initiatives. And in all of them, we are trying to bring together tourism departments and conservation departments. You know that sometimes uh, you have the conservation team uh, doing some, uh, some things, uh, some initiatives, and then the uh, tourism team doing different things and quite often 
things that go in contradiction. So what we had in mind is these two teams need to be speaking to each other to find common solutions to the challenges that they are both facing. So this is why we are trying to bring together on the one side, uh, the conservation and the public sector. So that's to say uh, protective areas, parks, uh, protective area management bodies, conservation organizations, sustainability organizations, and on the other side, the tourism industry and the private sector. So uh, tour operators, both local and international service providers, um, destination management organizations, tourism boards, etc. So once we have these two teams talking to each other, we are trying to develop travel experiences that have these four values that we have here, compassion, connection, community, and conservation. So we are trying to offer uh, locally crafted travel experiences uh, where the protected area is at the center of the experiences and the conservation values are uh, the very center of uh, the itiner itineraries that are developed. And also we are trying to offer uh, trusted and measured sustainability. These travel experiences that we are trying to, to develop and to support developing are, are uh, multi-day experiences that have different components. So they are complete experiences that have food and drinks, that have transport and mobility, different activities and services, and also accommodation. So as you know, that sometimes images speak louder than words. I would like to show you a video, hopefully it will work, uh, with, where you will be uh, see, you, where you will see uh, the type of experiences that we develop. So you will see all these four components that we uh, trying to include in these uh, ecotourism experiences, and you will see the local component in it. You will see the culture of the place included in it. You will see uh, the local people involved in the itinerary. So uh, enjoy the experiences that we try to develop. Lucia. Is there sound? We can't hear the sound with it right now, but we can see it. Sorry? Uh, Lucy, is there sound with it as well, or just the... Um, uh, just there the... is sound. It's If you cannot hear it, uh, it's just music, so it's not that important. Uh, maybe, I don't know what's happening with, with the sound, but you will get the idea of it, even without the sound. Okay. So this was an example coming from Albania, but it's just an example of, of the type of things that we are trying to promote within the Meet Network. Um, and just for you to have a, a general idea of the type of experiences that are, uh, that are part of what we do. So uh, behind uh, this video that you have just seen, there is a, a model, what we call the Meet model that is not a certification process, but it's a way of presenting nature and culture as part of the storytelling of the travel experience. Uh, so you will see here that it's a four-step model. You will see the first step is the local ecotourism cluster, then the ecotourism product development, then uh, we will go on to the measuring sustainability and the quality of the product, and finally providing market access to the itinerary and the tourism offer that's been developed. So uh, as I was saying, this is not a certification process. It's something that can be done 
in parallel before or after going through a certification process, something that can help to improve uh, the ecotourism offer that is being developed. So uh, in this first step that you will see here, which is the, the establishment of a local ecotourism cluster, you may be thinking, what is a local ecotourism cluster? It's just a kind of a working group. Uh, it's a, a group of different stakeholders, both uh, private and public that are working together, that are discussing from the beginning uh, to be able to create a tourism offer that is following the values of every stakeholder. So um, you will see that uh, as the basis, we need to have the protected area and the local tour operator. We need to have the protected area because as I was saying, is the center of the experience that we are promoting. And we need to have a tour operator because it's the one that will be able to be selling the product at the end of the process. But we can also have other stakeholders coming from the tourism sector, for example, accommodation providers, uh, restaurant owners, tour guides, uh, transportation providers, etc. We can also have uh, other stakeholders coming from the conservation sector besides the protected area, uh, for example, a conservation organization. And we can also have the local community sector, so civil society organizations, but also the local government, etc. So uh, as you will see, as the minimum, we need to have the protected area and the true operator, but we can also have additional stakeholders that can bring uh, new input and new ideas to the table. So this would be the first step. And once that we have this local ecotourism cluster uh, established, this uh, working group, we will move on to the ecotourism product development. So as I was saying, uh, we think of these ecotourism itineraries as uh, complete experiences that include activities and services, accommodation, food and drink, transport, and tour operations. And this process for us, is not, it's not just conceiving the itinerary, creating the itinerary, and that is the end, no. So we believe that we need to do some iterations. So maybe the first um, result that we have is a nice product, is a nice product but we can uh, improve it and get uh, a better product. So we think that we need to do several iterations uh, and we do that by hearing the feedback that we get from real customers if we have them, or we the feedback that we have from uh, product testers, that we have from auditors that may test the product and see if it's working or not, uh, what can we change to make it better, etc. And then we can have an action plan where we have some actions that are going to be leading to a, uh, an improved version of the product. So once we have uh, a product that is not going to be uh, the end version of the product, it's just going to be a version that is going to be improved. We move on to the third step of the model, which is uh, measuring the sustainability and the quality of the uh, ecotourism itinerary. So uh, here, um, this is what I will be mainly focusing on in the next slides, but we will be measuring uh, different aspects such as the ecological footprint, uh, the social component, uh, but also the governance and the quality of the product, etc. So I will be focusing a little bit more on that uh, in the next slides. And finally, once we have a final product that we are happy to share and that we think uh, that tourists are going to be loving, we are going to be putting that product in the uh, market and giving access to actual tourists to test uh, the product and to experience this itinerary that we have created. So what's behind uh, what we do in the mid model? So we have uh, what we call the mid standard, which is a complete set of criteria and indicators that help to manage the quality and the sustainability of the ecotourism uh, products that we are going to be developing. So we have two main pillars. We have the enabling conditions on the one hand and the product on the other hand. So uh, for the enabling conditions, those are like the framework pillars that we need uh, to support ecotourism development, to ensure that the ecotourism development uh, process uh, has a good basis uh, for, for being developed. And then we have 
the product pillar that is going to be ensuring that the product that we are developing has high quality, that is attractive from a tourism point of view, and that it is actually sustainable uh, in terms of um, environmentally sustainable and socially sustainable. So those are um, the, the main uh, pillars that we have behind the standard. And then, because we, we told ourselves it's really nice to have this standard, it's really nice to have this set of indicators, but we need to present this in an approachable way. We need to create a, a user-friendly platform that allows people to self-assess the sustainability and the quality of the multi-day tourism products that they are creating and see if they are aligned with the MIT standard and with the proposal that we are making. So. Uh, we developed this ecotourism indicator monitoring platform that you can see on the screen and um, you will be able to access it uh, through monitoring.meetnetwork.org. You have the link here uh, at the bottom of the screen and uh, it's a platform that is free to use. Everyone can register and test it and see what uh, tools they are interested in. You do not have to use all the four tools that are in the ecotourism indicator monitoring platform. You can pick and choose the ones that uh, are more suited to what you are trying to be, you are trying to measure. So as I was saying, we have uh, four different tools that are uh, focusing on the different aspects that are included in the MIT standard. So one of the key ones is the ecological footprint calculator uh, is, um, something key that we have developed in collaboration with the Global Footprint Network. So uh, we use their methodology and we adapted it to the tourism industry. So um, it has been, as I was saying, customized to measure the ecological footprint of a tour package, including the different four aspects that we were mentioning before. So uh, accommodation, activities, transportation, and food and drinks. So the output of this tool allows you to see the footprint of the package that you have developed, also the footprint per person participating in the package and also per activity included in the package. So you will see here a little bit of what's behind the, the calculator. So in practice, this ecological footprint calculator is measuring how many natural resources uh, we use to produce the goods and the services that we consume and how many we need to absorb uh, our wastes and our emissions. So this allows us to quantify uh, tourism pressures, to assess the products, as I was saying, accommodation, transport, activities, services, food and drink offer, and also uh, use the data that is collected to see where we can improve and also to get some recommendations of actions that we can implement to improve the ecological footprint. So you will see here a little bit uh, of the interface. This is what you will be able to see when you access the monitoring platform. You can either uh, register or use it without uh, registering. And if you register, you will be able to save your progress if you don't finish it uh, on the day that you start working on it, you can save the progress and continue uh, when you have additional time. You can download the results uh, in PDF or you can see them there on the dashboard on your, on your personal area. And you can see the different solutions and recommendations that we are proposing uh, to improve the ecological footprint of your package. So uh, if those recommendations are not enough, uh, we as the Mid Network are, and also the Global Footprint Network are also available to uh, try to solve any doubts that you may have. So uh, we are also uh, available for that. And this is just an example of what you can find in the Ecological Footprint Calculator. Here we are in the food and drinks uh, section of the calculator. And uh, you will see that obviously you will need to input quite a lot of detail to be able to have uh, accurate data. So the uh, that data collection process is a bit heavy, but if we want to have 
the data that we need to make appropriate decisions. It's true that we need to enter and input quite a lot of information. So here you will see an example where we are going to be detailing the type of uh, food that we're, we are going to be serving uh, tourists, for example, uh, their uh, origin, if they are local or not, if they are organic or not, uh, how are the portions, how they are cooked, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So this is just an example on the uh, food uh, side. And then once you have uh, completed all the information and all the data, you will be able to see the results, uh, the ecological footprint of your package. So here you have an example and you will be able to see different types of results. So for example, you will be able to see the ecological footprint of the whole ecotourism package. So the overall impact that this package has uh, you will be able to see also the ecological footprint per tourist per day. You will be able to see the ecological footprint by land type. So you have here the different uh, land types that you will be able to see, cropland, grazing, forest, fishing, built up area and carbon. And you will be able to see also the ecological footprint by activity. So the four types of activities that we were discussing, accommodation, food and drinks, mobility and activities and services. And one interesting thing, at least it was for me when I started to, to, to see this methodology, was that food and drinks was always, almost always, the greatest driver of the ecological footprint. So at least myself, I thought, well, transport must be the biggest driver. No. The one that was the largest driver was food and drinks. And here we have to think that we are measuring the actual ecotourism package once you are in the destination. So that's a little bit the answer to, to the question. You are not measuring uh, the footprint of the transport to get to the destination. You are measuring the footprint of the package once you get to the destination. So that's uh, the answer to why food and drinks is the largest driver as well. So once you get your results, you will also be able to uh, see a benchmarking uh, in comparison with other uh, results, other packages that we have um, in the in the mid network. And as I was saying, if that's not enough, if the recommendations that you are getting are not enough, you can always get in touch with us at MIT or the Global Footprint Network to get uh, additional uh, guidance. So as I was saying, uh, the idea is not to have a first product and then there, the idea is to continue improving the product that we develop and get better results. So here you will see an example of round one, the first one that we measure the ecological footprint of a product and round two. And you will see the ecological footprint is uh, way, way less important than the first time. So you will see that mainly the food and greens category was reduced. So you will get different kinds of recommendations depending on the data that you are inputting. But for example, uh, <coughs> sorry, the quantity of food that you are offering to tourists might be a big factor. At least here in the Mediterranean, we tend to offer too much food. So uh, reducing the quantity is one of the recommendations that you might get. Or offering less uh, red meat, for example, or trying to uh, use products that come from uh, shorter distances. So those are some of the recommendations that you may get. Sorry, I'm going to drink a little bit because I'm getting, my throat is getting dry. So this is what the ecological footprint offers to you. As I was saying, you can go then to, to the monitoring platform and, and try to explore it, explore it a little bit more. Then we also have another component, another tool, which is the social impact assessment. Uh, this assessment is uh, based on a simplified version of the product social impact assessment methodology that was developed at the Social Value Initiative. So we are trying uh, not to reinvent the wheel and try to, to use already existing standards and assessments that are uh, out there. So this is the basis of this assessment. And for the social impact assessment, we are focusing on four key areas, four key, four key uh, stakeholder areas. So workers, local community, 
value chain and also the customer or the tourist. So in these four different areas, we are using these indicators that are uh, measuring the, uh, for example, the working conditions that the people involved in the tourism package are going through. Uh, for example, the seasonality, the working hours, the salary, their training opportunities, etc. Then for the local community, we are seeing also the health and safety, uh, capacity building, the percentage of local employment that uh, these tourism product is incorporating. For the value chain, we are seeing other indicators such as the well-being, uh, community access, the integration of sustainability in the supply chain, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And then for tourists, we are also seeing uh, if we have a feedback mechanism to be able to actually listen to what uh, the customer needs to to tell us, if we have a risk management plan, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So we have this list of indicators, and it is in a form of uh, self-assessment. So you will have, uh, I think there are uh, 25 different questions and you need to go through them, read the question and try to choose the option that is a best fit uh, to answer the question to your own situation. So here you have the example of uh, legal uh, or illegal uh, labor and you will need to answer this question to the best of your knowledge. And at the end, uh, the same way that with the ecological footprint calculator, you will get a set of recommendations that will be adapted to the results that you get. So, uh, for example, if you are getting some recommendations related to the partnerships involving the local community, you might be getting uh, these recommendations here. You need to establish a regular dialogue between the company and the local community. If you are getting a recommendation regarding the resident's perception of the tourism impact, you may need to, you may get uh, recommended to establish a system to monitor the resident's perception of tourism, et cetera, et cetera. So you will get recommendations uh, based on the replies to those questions that I was showing you. Then we will move on to the third tool that we are offering, which are the enabling conditions. So uh, the enabling condition, as I was explained, are related to the governance and the conservation. So are the basis to ensure that the tourism offer that we are developing is going to have uh, the, the, the best basis possible for it to, to succeed. And in terms of conservation, uh, we are using a simplified version of the Greenlist standard that you may have heard about. It's a standard that has been developed by IUCN to ensure that protected areas are effectively managed. So this is a simplification of that standard. And this is a way to understand if the protected area has the correct uh, management mechanisms to ensure a low impact. So for example, uh, if the protected area has a management plan, if um, the content of the, pro of the uh, tourism package includes uh, some conservation activities that are benefit benefiting the, the protected area, etc. And based on that, you will get uh, an ideal, a compliance or non-compliance situation. Then focusing on the governance of these local ecotourism clusters that we had previously developed, which are those uh, working groups that are uh, trying to uh, work together to develop these tourism experiences, you will measure if, if the protected area uh, and the destination are following uh, good governance systems. So here, for example, we will be ensuring uh, the representation of stakeholders within the local ecotourism cluster. You will be uh, seeing if they have a clear strategy and plan that they are going to be following. You will see if they are cooperating among each other, if they have a feedback mechanism, if uh, they are publishing, for example, uh, the main documents uh, so that they are available to, to the public to see, etc. And here again, uh, in the monitoring platform, we have a self-assessment that uh, has uh, different questions that are going to be targeting those governance issues, as you can see here, for example, legitimacy and voice, or those conservation uh, issues. For example, here, we are talking about the legal designation of the protected area. So uh, you will have a clear understanding 
of uh, where your protected area and your local ecotourism cluster stands uh, with relation to conservation and governance. And then finally, we have uh, the last tool of the four tools that we are uh, offering in this indicator monitoring platform, which is the product quality of the ecotourism experience. So uh, here we are measuring different things that are showing us if the itinerary that we have developed is aligned with the expectations of the tourism market, both buyers and also uh, the people that are going to be selling uh, the product on the international market, but also customers and the local community. Here again, you will get a self-assessment that uh, has around 50, 50 something questions. And you will go through different uh, topics such as uh, product concept, uh, target market, pricing, seasonality, storytelling, uh, health, uh, safety, I don't know, uh, guides involved in the in the product, human rights, animal welfare, a lot of topics that will give you a general idea of where your product stands. So this is all for the monitoring platform, but we then have additional tools and additional resources that are also free to use. Uh, you can simply go to the Meet Network uh, website, so meetnetwork.org, and you can access all of them. Uh, for example, we have quite a comprehensive uh, Meet manual that explains uh, the full methodology that we are offering in the Meet model, uh, the different indicators that we are promoting in the Meet standard, uh, how to go through all these four steps, uh, how to create and manage a local ecotourism cluster, how to develop an ecotourism product, how to measure the uh, quality and the sustainability of the product, how to market this product, and how to incorporate sustainability into uh, the different elements of the ecotourism package. So you have the Mint Manual, and you have additional tools and resources that we have developed through the years that are targeting different niches and different uh, stakeholders. For example, we also have uh, some guidelines that are uh, guiding uh, tourism boards and destination management organizations on how they should promote ecotourism so that it supports uh, the, the values that we are trying to promote in the mid network. So how to ensure uh, that we are uh, offering uniqueness uh, with our product, how to deliver a uh, good value for money, how to design uh, immersive and transformative experiences that are including the whole community in it, uh, how to brand and market uh, those ecotourism destinations, because sometimes we have a great product, but we are promoting the opposite type of product. So how to ensure that we are promoting uh, in the right way these products, but not only the right products, but also uh, during the right season or in the right places. And we also have other documents that we can, you can explore. Uh, one, for example, with good practices in ecotourism policy and governance, and you will see that we have um, made many other uh, publications that might be useful for you as well. And uh, finally, the, the last tool and the last resource that I wanted to, to share with you are some online learning uh, courses that we have developed. They are available at the IUCN Academy uh, and they are free to use. You can register for free and you can access them and get a certificate of, of completion as well at the end. And you will see here the four courses that we have uh, developed. One is about building and managing uh, effective ecotourism partnerships. So here we are uh, we are talking about these uh, local ecotourism clusters, but also beyond that. We have another one on how to design an attractive ecotourism experience. We have another one that is targeting uh, tourism guides and tourism leaders, which is showing how to uh, guide in and storytelling for an impactful ecotourism experience. And then we have another one, which is called compelling marketing of ecotourism. So uh, they are targeting different stakeholders. So you can pick and choose again the, the different uh, courses and modules that you are more uh, interested in. You will see here, if you are a protected area, maybe 
those three first are the ones that can be more interesting to you and the last one can be optional. If you are a tour operator, maybe the first one is optional and the rest of them are very relevant to you. If you are a destination management organization, an NGO, a, a municipality, maybe the first two are more relevant. The third one, you can do it, but it's not so targeting, uh, so targeted to, to your type of stakeholder. And finally, if you are a tour leader and guide, maybe the first one is not that relevant, but then you will find others that are relevant. So as I was saying, you can go to this link, iucnacademy.org, and you can access these four courses. The first one on how to build in ecotourism partnerships, you will be seeing concepts such as stakeholder participation, stakeholder engagement for ecotourism, how to create and manage a local ecotourism cluster, etc. Then if you go to, to the second course, you will see uh, in this modules how to get to know the target market, how to package ecotourism product, how to ensure health, safety, and responsibility in the trip. Then you have the other one on guiding and storytelling for an impactful ecotourism experience. And here you will know more about interpretation, guiding, tour leading, uh, how to improve your interpretation techniques, how to ensure professional development. You will see some case studies with uh, some uh, reference um, ideas that people are doing. And finally, you will have the final course, which is dealing with compelling marketing of ecotourism, which has uh, different modules that are dealing with uh, how to match products to market needs, how to set the right price for an ecotourism itinerary. Maybe we don't know how to approach that, uh, how to approach marketing and ensure we are using storytelling as the guiding thread throughout the, the itinerary. And those are the four courses that we have developed. So the idea that is behind this whole Mid Network Association is to show the Mediterranean in a different way and try to see different aspects of the Mediterranean that we are not so used to. So uh, you will see that everything that I have presented today is uh, very focused on the Mediterranean, but you can easily use those same tools, those same principles and ideas in other areas that are not the Mediterranean or even that are not protected areas. Uh, you can uh, try to, as I was saying, pick and choose the parts that think are more relevant to you and try to use them maybe uh, with along with other tools or maybe as a standalone tools if you think they are useful uh, useful for you. So this is everything that they had prepared for today. Uh, I hope you have understood a little bit what we have developed. I know uh, that I have presented quite a lot of different tools and different uh, ideas and standards and indicators. So I know you, you will need more time to explore them in detail if you want to know more about them. But just to leave you here uh, the contact uh, for the website, you can go to uh, midnetwork.org and you can explore the different tools and the different things that we do at the Midnetwork. And then here you have my email. Uh, lucia.prieto at iucn.org and if not you can directly contact the secretariat of the mid network in the email address that you have here you also have here the social media accounts of the mid network and some key resources such as the mid manual that i was sharing with you the training modules the monitoring platform etc so that was everything from my side and uh Thank you so much for, for listening to so many things that I had to say. <laughs> I'm happy to, to answer your questions to, to the best of my ability now. Lucia, thank you so much. This was wonderful. These are great resources and it's wonderful to learn that they can be used even outside the Mediterranean and protected areas. So we really appreciate this very uh, informative uh, um, overview of them. Uh, and I, I imagine lots of people are looking forward to diving in. So we already have some questions and I'll go ahead and start with some of those. And if you have additional questions for Lucia, go ahead and put them in the question and answer box and or the chat. And um, even if we can't get them to the day, I'll make sure Lucia uh, sees them. 
Okay, well, we'll start out with a question that came in pretty early on. Can you please explain the rationale behind including passion as a core value of your ecotourism network and or definition? Thank you. So compassion is a tricky one because when we translate it into different languages, we have tried to translate it into Spanish and French, for example, and you kind of get the wrong idea of it. You kind of get the idea of uh, charity more than anything else from compassion. So it is a tricky one that we are seeing if maybe we need to change it or not, if it's uh, understandable or not. Uh, the approach is that uh, compassion towards the residents and the local communities that are uh, experiencing the arrival of tourists and trying to uh, support them and support uh, their ecosystems uh, through the ecotourism experiences that we are trying to be developing. So uh, we are trying to um, to get uh, them to have an ownership of the tourism experience that we are trying to develop. So uh, to, to have them into account from the very beginning. So as I was saying, ideally they could be in some way or the other uh, part of these local ecotourism clusters. So we will have some kind of representation of the of the society and hopefully we will be compassionate towards them, uh, uh, offering an ecotourism uh, experience that takes them into account and that does not harm uh, their ecosystems. Okay, thank you so much, Lucia. Um, another question that came in, what types of activities and services are included in the ecological footprint calculator? And how do they account for their impact on the environment, including potential degradation of natural resources? So uh, there it will be uh, you inputting the type of activity, but for example, you can think about a uh, kayaking activity. That could be an example, uh, scuba diving, trekking, uh, etc. So you will have different parameters that can be adapted to the different activities that you are offering. So uh, you will be explaining, for example, do you need a transportation to get to the place uh, where you will be developing the activity? Uh, how many people will be involved in providing the activity? For example, you will have an, ex an instructor or uh, you will have uh, two instructors going with you with a kayak, that will be also a question. So you have different parameters that can be adapted to the different types of activities. And then depending on the responses that you give to, to, to that question, uh, you will get a calculation of the impact that you are, uh, you are putting into the, the environment and the different ecosystems that we are measuring. Okay, thank you, Lucia. Another question that came in, does your ecological footprint measure if the fish served at lunch or dinner comes from a sustainable fishery in the in the destination? How about industrial versus small scale fisheries? Uh, that's something I need to check. I know that we we do track the origin of the product, both in terms of distance, if they are local products or not, uh, and also on the type of um, company that is providing uh, those produces to you. So if it's a, a small uh, company or not, uh, if it's considered organic or not. So in the uh, referred to fisheries, it's a little bit more tricky. But uh, yeah, those things are kind of taken into account. I would need to check if in the case of fisheries, there are any extra questions that help to know that. But in any case, yes, there are some parameters that can help to know that, but uh, not completely. <laughs> okay, thank you, and Lucia. Just to add here okay, that good. it's not a, a perfect methodology. It's very difficult to, to gather all the data and sometimes, you know, that service providers or the different companies uh, may not even have all the information that you are looking uh, to have, yet that you are willing to collect. So. It can give you an approximation uh, of the of the result, but in some cases you will not be able to have a hundred percent of the answers that you are looking for uh, coming from the data. So, uh, the the more data you have, uh, the the more uh, objective the result is going to be. But in any case, you will have an approximation to to the ecological footprint. Okay. All right. Thank you, Lucia. Um, another question. Can these tools be utilized to establish baseline indicators for determining carrying capacity of an area? And if so, how would they support this assessment? 
how the tools support this assessment. Mm -hmm. So no, you will not be able to find the carrying capacity of an area using those tools. So uh, they can support to have an idea of the type of product that you need to develop of uh, maybe when you are doing this uh, final assessment of the product and you are having, I don't know, uh, seven people doing uh, this, uh, going through this itinerary, you will get an idea of these seven people, but using these tools alone will not give you the carrying capacity of a destination. That would be a, a separate thing. But in the basis of the MIT model and the MIT methodology, these experiences that we are trying to measure are a small groups activities. So we already have that in mind. So in principle, if you go through the through the MIT methodology and the MIT manual that I was sharing, some of the principles that we are promoting from the beginning is trying to develop products that are targeting small groups that are uh, not targeting uh, mass itineraries, to say it that way, and also that are targeting uh, not the peak season, but uh, the off-shoulder uh, seasons. Okay. All right. Thank you, Lucia. Um, There's a question. Have you or anyone else been tracking the socio-cultural changes in communities with rapid tourism growth? What are some of the cultural impacts, say, as wealthier Northern Europeans gentrify the med? So not here, not in the mid network. We are, of course, aware of it coming from uh, additional studies, uh, but it's, it has not been our the core of our research. But of course, uh, there has been an impact, and uh, the the med is having quite a lot of uh, issues now with the tourism industry, and uh, we are seeing many good things happening in uh, different uh, niche opportunities. So we have, for example, activity to, uh, tourism, ecotourism, community-based tourism that are doing quite good things, but they are still uh, some niche activities. So uh, we need to join forces and try for that to be to be the uh, the norm and not for mass tourism to, to be the norm. But uh, yeah, we do not have specific studies on that, but we are aware of the situation. Um, okay, thank you, Lucia. Um, another question that came in, is there any interest in measuring behavior change impacts of ecotourism on consumers? Very interesting indeed. Uh, we we have used uh, some uh, some researches and some statistics that are showing uh, the changes that are happening in the tourism industry. Uh, for example, this is a small case, but for example, uh, Booking does a, an interesting survey every single year that uh, that is showing uh, how. Uh, tourist behavior is changing throughout the years. And we see the, the percentage of people, for example, that are willing to pay more for a sustainable experience. And that percentage is growing year by year. So we do have uh, that, we do see that that changes are happening. We see that people are more willing uh, not only to uh, try these experiences, but also to spend more, uh, to spend more time in the destination to ensure that their revenue is bigger instead of just spending half a day in one place and moving to the other. So we do see those changes, maybe not as, not as fast as we would like to, but those changes are there, yeah. Okay, thank you, Lucia, and that's good to hear. Um, a final question, um, how is climate change incorporated into the tools? So uh, climate change is at the at the basis, at the baseline of uh, everything that we try to do. So we assume that climate change is a big thing and mainly the Mediterranean is a, a climate change a hotspot host, clearly. So it is taken into account as the baseline of uh, how the situation is and how we do not need to contribute any further to this. So it is taken into account, but it's not included. If your question if, is if it's included in some kind of indicator or criteria, it is not there, but it's assumed as something that is already happening in the destination from the very beginning. Okay. All right, great. Um, Lucia, we still have some more great questions we're not gonna be able to get to, but I'll make them available afterwards. Um, yeah, and Lucia... I'm happy, yeah, you have any additional questions. I know that we do not have any more time, but uh, you can send it uh, through email either to, to you or to directly to, to me or the uh, Mid Network uh, email, and I will be happy to reply to them later on. 
Wonderful. Thank you so much. Um, this is wonderful work, and we were so glad to be able to feature it. And thank you to everyone who attended and for your great questions. And um, we're hoping more people can can use the meat tools to uh, assess ecotourism in their own areas. Uh, thank you, Lucia, again for being on, and thank you for this great work. And we look forward to uh, following this work as well as some of the other work we talked about. Thank you so much, Sarah, for the invitation. I'm very happy to to have been here with you today. All right. Thank you, everyone. I hope you have a great rest of your day.